This episode is brought to you by AHP Servicing. AHP Servicing uses crowdsourced funding to purchase troubled mortgages at a discount and then find consensual and affordable solutions for struggling homeowners. Investors can earn up to 10% per year, borrowers stay in their homes, and local communities gain stability. AHP Servicing is proud to be the only socially responsible servicer in the country. And they're on a mission to provide best-in-class loan servicing, too. To learn more, visit their website at www.ahpservicing.com or call 1-866-AHP-TEAM. You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Montecito, California, this is my new setup for the time being. I am playing musical homes right now. Long story, but uh, not fun. I don't like moving. Before we begin talking about today's topic, I do want to remind you that there is an entire website uh, that you must not neglect that goes along with this podcast. It's called wealthformula.com. And that's where you go if you want to participate a little bit more. Lots of resources over there for you and also opportunities to sign up for our accredited investor group and also potentially sign up for Wealth Formula Network. Anyway, go and check it out, wealthformula.com. Now, as for uh, today's show, and by the way, I should point out that we are sort of skipping ahead. There, you know, Last week, we had an Ask Buck show, and normally I would do multiple in a row, but I just felt like some level of urgency to get this one out and you'll see why. But, uh, you know, the the issue is, if unless you're living in a cave, you know, you've noticed that there's this craze out there right now, the cryptocurrency bull market. Now, if you've been ignoring this distributed ledger technology thing altogether, I will tell you that I really believe you will regret it if you don't start paying attention in a very short period of time. Listen, I understand why people get suspicious of the space. The cryptocurrency ecosystem is indeed full of scammers and hype. Talks of Lambos and mooning. I mean, it's something that's hardly something that you can take seriously if you consider yourself a sophisticated investor, right? But amidst the noise lies the technology that will fundamentally transform the world. And I really do believe that, you know, I see the crypto market right now is very similar to what happened in the nineties with the dawn of the internet and related technology companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. Most of the dot coms went out of business and there was uh, ridiculous hype and valuations. The pet dot coms of the world died pretty quickly. They had you know, companies had no revenue generating products and certainly didn't even come close to making money, yet they had massive, massive valuations because they had the word dot com related with them. You know, and by the way, you see something similar with even in the stock market, people using the word blockchain, companies using the word blockchain just to, you know, crank up their own stock values. Anyway, when that dot com era came crashing down, you know, the skeptics at the time all said, I told you so. I mean, Warren Buffett obviously stayed out of that whole thing. And Manny looked at it and said, there's just no way I'm getting involved. And of course he didn't. And when the crash came, everybody said, look, Warren Buffett was right. And listen, they were right about the hysteria, but they also missed out on early investments into companies that would eventually become the largest companies in the world. I mean, seriously, the biggest companies in the world came out of that time, right? Recovering from the ashes of the dot-com debacle were companies like Amazon, Google, Apple. I mean, that's just naming a few, right? The dot-com period of the 90s was, I guess, if you look at it in a revisionist history sort of way, Hardly a failure, right? It was hardly a failure. It was actually, yeah, it was overvalued and there was craziness, but some people really, really, you know, made life-changing investments early on who were paying attention and weren't scared away by what was going on and what people were saying. 
Now, cryptocurrency skeptics look at the current technological craze the same way. However, just like in the dot-com era, there's going to be some big winners that come out of the frenzy, and they will become household names. Now, I got to ask you this. Knowing that, don't you want a chance to be part of it? I mean, to go back in time and invest in companies like Amazon and Google in their infancy, you know, if that's the case... You have to change your perspective on what's happening right now and try to weed through the useless stuff like, you know, hearing about Dogecoin and, you know, how Dogecoin is going up because Elon Musk uh, makes some tweets. You got to start looking at these projects like you would look at any other project in which you might invest, right? You got to start by learning at a high level. What is this whole distributed world, this technology, all about in the first place? I mean, what's the big deal? Then learn about individual projects. You know, if, if, you've, if you've got the interest and time to do so, that might really help you create some wealth in your life. Look at them like you would any other investments. Who are the developers? What is their mission? And what do they aim to do? And what, you know, probably even more importantly, in this short period of time that is the you know cryptocurrency world, what have they already done? Because you'll be amazed that some companies have already done incredible things in very short periods of time. Listen, cryptocurrency is not going away. Bitcoin is here to stay and it will become a globally recognized commodity like gold someday. And while most other projects are going to die, others will become the fabric of ultimately what becomes a new decentralized world with a new internet and everything. As an investor, I got to tell you, opportunities like these to be part of the new evolving economy don't happen very often. And frankly, you know, they may not ever happen again in our lifetime. So I personally recognize that. And while I have no idea who the winners and losers are going to be, I have no idea. I can tell you that Hedera is one of my personal picks for a company that will become a household name over the next few years. So much so, I didn't even know if it becomes a household name or if it just becomes in the background part of everything you do. Uh, you'll see why. And, and listen, a full disclaimer on this interview, I am a big investor in HBAR, the native token for Hedera. It's by far away my biggest within my cryptocurrency bag. So anyway, I want to take this episode and I, I bumped the ass buck episode for the week because I wanted you to learn why I'm so bullish on this project called Hedera uh, and its native token HBAR. And I had a chance to uh, get back the co-founder and CEO, Mance Harmon, to the show. So after these messages, when we come back, Mance Harmon with Hedera. Wealth Formula investors, let me tell you about something that I have been investing in for years, something that's profitable, tax efficient, and uncorrelated to the economy. And when I say profitable, I mean over 25% cash on cash over seven years and an internal rate of return with depreciation benefits of almost 31%. I'm talking about investing in an institutional quality portfolio of ATM machines with a top five national operator. And if you need bonus depreciation this year, deduct every penny of your investment with bonus depreciation. If you are an accredited investor, you should check this out for yourself at WFVelocity.com. Again, that's WFVelocity.com. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is really exciting. His name is Mance Harmon. He is the co-founder and CEO of Hedera, Hedera Hashgraph. I guess we can get some clarification on exactly what's going on with the name there. And of course, for those of you who are into cryptocurrency, the native coin is HBAR. Mance was on the show a few years ago when really this project hadn't even taken off. And it's been three or four years. And he was kind enough to come back on the show and give us a little bit of an update. And so, Mance, uh, welcome back to Wealth Formula Podcast. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be back. Great. You know, uh, I'm going to start from the basics a little bit because, again, 
you know, so much of my audience is, you know, 40, 50 somethings that are real estate investors. And obviously, you know, you and you and Liman are our generation, but, you know, most of us are not really into this stuff, right? And so I'd like to talk a little bit, given all of the, you know, the hype of cryptocurrency and, you know, the the stuff that you think about that I think that was negative for the space for a long time, you know, the talk of the Lambos and the mooning, uh, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, there is technology, uh, you know, known as distributed ledger technology, which is presumably a big deal. And uh, assuming that it is, uh, how does it change our lives? Why, why is it such a big deal? Yeah. Well, so let's just start with the basics. Um, yeah. When people say distributed ledger, conceptually, it's useful to think about it just as a database. Yeah. And um, when we think about what happened in the 1990s and the 2000s with sort of that first wave of innovation on the Internet, and we look at the properties, the, uh, you know, the businesses that have been built since then, you know, the big brands that we all know, those are all using a centralized business model, a centralized database, technically, uh, that they completely control. And what was discovered with Bitcoin in 2008 was a different approach, approach where you can have a database but instead of that database being owned and administered by a single party, you can have different parties, each running a copy of the database, each making updates to the database, this common database, and all of those updates being reflected in near simultaneously in a way that the community of database operators can trust the information that it it's not possible for a single node operator that's operating a, a node in this common database to manipulate the information in such a way to prevent transactions from occurring or to cause the information to be viewed differently by one party than another party. The, the innovation was the ability to provide security in a way that wasn't previously possible. And that gives rise to new business models where instead of having a single organization that is running a car service or a bookstore or whatever, what have you, yeah. right? You can have a community of participants that have sort of disintermediated the need for a trusted third party. They can operate it collectively and as a result, the trust, both in the integrity of the processes of this business or organization, uh, as well as in the uh, representation of the value that is, that is used and, and transferred between parties in, in this business, whatever it is, that can be trusted in a way that you, you can't trust a single monolithic organization to operate today. So in the concept really is about decentralization. Right. And and that's to me sort of the big difference, whereas you look at um, in theory right now, if you have big tech companies like Facebook or Amazon and, you know, they're owned uh, by a central authority. And in this situation, you might have something very similar to Facebook or Amazon, but it's owned by a community and therefore not, you know, it's not at the whims of one centralized, uh, you know, power center. That's it. That's it. And when we say owned, I mean, I use that word loosely. It may or may not be the case that the community literally owns equity in an organization. And in most cases, they don't. And, you know, in most cases, it's a community operated and run uh, application or endeavor. And uh, they may have governance rights. In some cases, they may have dividend rights, but it's not its not a foregone conclusion that they have either. It's just that they could be participating in the process of operating this database in a trusted way because thats uh, it's just part of the ethos of, of decentralization. So most distributed ledgers use blockchain, uh, starting from the Bitcoin blockchain, and obviously Ethereum is the probably the next best one known, 
But Hashgraph, um, uh, and by the way, can you just clarify, because I've seen the words changing around now. Is it, is it, are you going just by Hedera now, or are you? We are. Sorry? Well, I mean, t- that's yeah. a great question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, you know, when we, when we started uh, the organization, we did call it Hedera Hashgraph, and, and that was because it was a sort of a trademarked version of Hashgraph. Right. Hashgraph is an algorithm, yeah. a consensus algorithm. And Hedera is the organization that's using Hashgraph. But over time, we knew that um, that the Hashgraph would eventually be dropped. Yeah. And, and and it would just happen sort of naturally. The community would come to know us and just start calling us Hedera. Got it. And I think we're near that point. Yeah. Okay. Well, just getting back to my question then, I just want to, I don't want to keep saying the wrong name, but can you give us a high level look at the different sort of technologies, you know, blockchain versus, you know, the the type of consensus or decentralization mechanism uh, that that Hedera uses and shed light on what makes, you know, Hedera different? Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's not really hard to understand. Blockchain is a term that represents both what we call a data structure. And in this case, it is a chain of blocks of transactions. And so you have your miners that each run a a, a rig, a computer, and they have a local copy of the blockchain, a chain of blocks of transactions. Of course, this is all ones and zeros in in, in the computer, right? Um, And when transactions get submitted to the blockchain network, whatever flavor that is, could be Ethereum or Bitcoin or any number of first generation and second generation platforms, when a transaction gets submitted, that transaction goes to all the miners. All the miners get all transactions and they collect them and put them into a block. And then all these miners compete with one another to solve a really hard math problem, a cryptographic problem. The miner that solves that problem first earns the right to take their block of transactions, send it around to all the other miners, all the other miners receive that block and check that the proof of the work that was done is there. That's where proof of work as a term Mm -hmm. comes from that, you know, they did solve that math problem and assuming they did, then all the other miners take that block and they put it on top of their chain, their local copy of the chain. And that's how the blockchain gets built Mm -hmm. over time. And that cryptographic puzzle uh, problem, it's calibrated to always take about 10 minutes in the case of Bitcoin for one of these miners to, to solve the problem. So approximately every 10 minutes, a new block gets put on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, for example. In our case, it works fundamentally differently. Uh, there, it, It's not linear in the same sense. Hashgraph, again, is a term that represents both a data structure and a way for the community to come to consensus on the order of transactions. Hashgraph is a graph. You have all the nodes. They're not called miners anymore. You have all the node operators in the network. And anyone that has a transaction can submit it to any one of those not node operators. The node operators sort of gossip those transactions among themselves. And as the transactions come in, in real time, uh, they sort of pile up, if you want to think of it that way, in this graph, this mathematical structure that's called a graph. And then the community has a way, without going into the math, on how to come to agreement on the order of those transactions within the graph. But the important point is that it's operating in parallel, not in serial in the way that blockchain is. And there's no proof of work. There's no need to solve a hard math problem. So there's no delay that is required. It's just as the transactions flow in, they come to an agreement on the order in real time on all the new transactions. And, and as a result, the hash graph is orders of magnitude faster in terms of transactions per second and at a much lower cost because you don't have the proof of work. You're not wasting all this electricity to solve a math problem. 
the way that blockchain does. And those are the differences. And, mm-hmm. and one, it just represents first generation technology and hash yeah. graph is, is best of breed. Now, uh, security is also an issue, right? And um, you want to talk a little bit about sort of the, you know, we can, however you want to describe the asynchronous Byzantine uh, tolerance, yeah. why that's significant. I mean, m- most people are going to have no clue what we're talking about, but just in a, so just in terms of a non-technical explanation of that and why that's you that and how that's a little bit unique too. Yeah. Well, so the industry, the academic uh, world for distributed consensus has been studying how to have computers come into agreement with one another on this shared database for decades. It's not new. It's just what's new is the, the discovery of new consensus algorithms that make it far more efficient. And um, when we talk about asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance, all that means is that you don't have to make certain assumptions about a potential attacker of the network. For example, it, it, those algorithms that are not asynchronous, the asynchronous prefix here is important, for those that aren't asynchronous, means that they have to make assumptions like there are no firewalls in the world. And of course, there are firewalls. And that certain types of denial of service attacks are not going to be executed against against the network in certain ways, which of course is, is not a reasonable assumption. The real world is real. And you have to address the full range of potential attacks but uh, until Hashgraph, until recently, the, the ability to have the maximum level of security, the level of security that makes no assumptions uh, that are real world assumptions, you know, sort of exclude the realities of, of the world we live in, and the ability to be performant have been, in, you know, you can't have both. It's been the case that if you maximize security, that comes at the cost of performance. And what my co-founder Lehman, Lehman Baird invented was the first algorithm that both maximizes security and maximizes performance simultaneously. And that's the value of of Hashgraph. It solved that problem. So I'm thinking here and people are saying, okay, so you're telling me it's faster. Uh, It is you know, less expensive and it's the most secure you can possibly be. So there's criticisms too. And uh, maybe you can address those, which is, I think the idea by some, for some reason, um, you know, the, again, the concept being for in general, that decentralization is key to this entire technology. There's some criticism by some who say, well, you know, Hedera and, you know, HBAR, doesn't seem particularly decentralized uh, because of, you know, some things such as the inability to fork off of it or because of governance. Uh, Can you address that? I mean, I I think this is a, it seems to be a big misunderstanding um, from what I read, uh, a lot of the criticisms. So Yeah, certainly. Well, when you think about decentralization, really you need to think about it along two dimensions. One is governance, and the other is sort of technical decentralization in coming to consensus on the order of transactions. So you have computers all that are executing software uh, the, that you know transactions flow in, and you have a, a number of computers that are voting on the order of transactions. Think of it that way, and they have to come to agreement. And um, And so that's what we'll call consensus or decentralization involving consensus. And then there's decentralization of governance. Those are the two categories that we need to consider. If we start with governance, when we talk about governance, what we're talking about are the decisions that are made with respect to the software and what changes or new features are going to be added to the software, how that code that operates the network evolves over time. And we might also include in there legal and regulatory posture, uh, use of treasury, those types of complex decisions for any global platform, any global network that is running a distributed ledger. In terms of governance, 
what we have, what we've intentionally done is chosen a council of some of the largest, most trustworthy organizations globally to provide the oversight and governance of, of the platform. In, in other words, be involved in that decision process. And when we've chosen those organizations, we've intentionally chosen organizations that are both distributed across industry uh, so that it's not a bunch of banks or not a bunch of tech giants, but we've got you know, a broad range of industries that are represented on the council that oversees the platform. It's distributed across geography. It's not all from, you know, US or Europe or whatever. It's global in terms of these, these organizations that are on the council. And then finally distributed through time. The council members can stay members up to two, three year terms. We're at 20 council members today, growing to 39. And we're, you know, we're adding some on roughly a monthly basis, you, you know, so sometimes it's a little more, sometimes a little less, but, but it's on that order. So we're, we're growing to 39. And uh, when you think about that governing body compared to say Bitcoin's governance or Ethereum's governance, the comparisons are, are pretty stark and, in the first generation platforms and most of the platforms out there today, what you have is a group of software developers that have come together to create a, a software, a, a, a network, you know, the, the software that runs the network, whatever the network might be. And there may be lots of developers contributing to that code base, but in reality, there are a handful of developers that control it, that decide what goes in and what doesn't go in. So I would argue that our governance model is one of the most decentralized, if not the most decentralized governance model in the whole market. Now, to be fair, there are some platforms out there that um, allow anyone that holds one of the tokens of the platform to vote on the, you know, these types of issues. I personally believe it's a bad approach when it comes to governance of these kinds of complex systems. And I'll just be very brief, 30 seconds here in sort of theory, governance theory. You, you can think of governance models, there are dictators, right? The problem with a dictator is that if, if, they're, if they're a good dictator, if they're a benevolent dictator, sometimes it works out. But it's really easy to compromise a dictator. You know, it's a single source of, of failure, so to think, sort of think of it in those terms. There are pure democracies. Pure democracies are fine if the decisions that are being made are not complex. If they're very simple decisions, then fine. Let, a, let the whole democracy vote, and, you know, up or down. When it comes to really complex decisions of the type that we just described, you don't really want a pure democracy. What you want is sort of a representational democracy, a representative democracy, where experts in those fields like legal law and marketing and, and tech and finance, et cetera, you want the experts to representatively uh, participate in a governance process. And that's what we do. So I think that our governance model is, um, by design, the most decentralized, and in my opinion, the best in the market. Uh, you have some Pretty interesting names in that council already, uh, including Google, IBM. Do uh, you want to talk about some of the, you know. Yeah. So those. we have Google and <clears throat> IBM and LG and Boeing. Um, from the banking side, we got Nomura <clears throat> out of Japan, uh, Standard Bank out of South Africa, Shinhan in South Korea. We have FIS WorldPay out of uh, Europe. Um at Magalu, Magazine Luisa, the, yeah. um, the one of the largest retailers in South America. The, so there's a so, there's a large group of them. And uh, Mance, are they all trying to? Are they currently uh, all the council members using the technology or in the process of trying to you know uh, utilize it into whatever they're doing right now? The vast majority are working on projects. I think is the right way yeah. to say it. Some of those have gone to market. Uh, DLA Piper is a good example. One of the largest law firms globally. 
has launched a token issuance platform called Toco, as an example. And they've been one of our council members nearly from the beginning. And so, it, it, you know, the different uh, organizations are in different stages with different interests for, for the reasons they're participating. You know, we, we talk a lot about macroeconomics uh, as it relates to investing and, you know, all the different moving parts in the government. Um, you know, I keep hearing about central banks uh, in general, interest in issuing digital currencies uh, that are essentially, uh, you know, decentralized. Um, but, you know, one of the questions I think a lot of people have is, well, isn't most of the currency that's in circulation actually digital anyway? And what, if that's the case, why do we need, you know, decentralized coins uh, or tokens or whatever you want to call them, decentralized dollars? Or what? what's the idea behind this with the central banks? No, well, that's a really good point, and it's exactly right. You know, in most cases, I, I don't know every government how they, ex, you know, yeah. issue their fiat. But, but in most cases, yes, the the currency is already in digital format, and it is a very fair question. It's a question that's often debated and considered when it comes to s- these uh, sovereign currencies, whether or not they need to use. Uh, d- distributed ledger technology. There is a case to be made that modern distributed ledger technology, even if operated, say by the central by mm-hmm. the Fed, by you know the participating banks in the Fed, is more secure in some ways than uh, old architectures, old database architectures. Now that has less to do with sort of the decentralization value prop that most people think about when they think about distributed distributed ledger technology more to do with just providing um, cyber security for a, a, a database that's managed by a single organization but but there's a case to be made there um, and it's also the case that you know most of these organizations most of these countries are are going to complete completely control the the network now it, it, it might be the case that for some of the smaller countries rather than managing launching and managing their own distributed ledger uh, currency based currency their central bank digital currency on a distributed ledger they potentially would use or partner with some of the commercial platforms that are in the market and so there is an opportunity for commercial platforms to participate in that way but I think that by and large for organizations like Hedera, who have a global distributed ledger network, we will work with those central banks to sort of augment what they already have, maybe be providing an integration layer between central bank digital currencies. That's, that's a possibility as well. But, um, but, but yeah, it's coming. And, you know, it's, it's on, we're, we're right on the edge of, of that transformation and it remains to be seen exactly how all that plays out. What role do you think right now? I mean, uh, uh, you know, with the technology you guys have, I assume there's in your dealing with banks, uh, already the largest bank in, uh, South Korea, I believe, et cetera. Have you, um, specifically has Hedera worked with any central banks on these types of solutions? Yeah, I'm not at liberty to say the specifics of what we're doing with our council members in, in this regard, but but it is the case that we have council members that care deeply about CBDCs, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over time. Yeah, one of the things that I would say, the uh, you know along the lines of just banks in in general, um, you know large organizations, government. Um, Hedera is sort of uniquely positioned there because there's a lot of regulatory uh, issues involved with those larger organizations. Is, don't, would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Um, well, so when we started the organization back in 2017 and we were, you know, Lehman and I were just sort of initially hiring our, our first team members, uh, one of the very first hires was my general counsel. Fantastic attorney, Natalie Furman is her name. 
And that's because we understood for the industry to go mainstream meant that there needed to be both regulatory clarity and that the, the platforms that would benefit are those that tried to be as compliant as possible. And so, you know, against sort of conventional wisdom, we decided to incorporate in Delaware, so we're a U.S.-based organization, Delaware-based LLC. All the council members that I mentioned before, they're LLC members. It's very real in, in a legal sense. It's not yeah. just a marketing agreement right. that we're talking about here. And we, init- we immediately engaged uh, in conversations with the various regulators because I think that compliance is a selling feature. Yeah, uh, it goes against the ethos. They sort of the, yeah, if right, you look at right. the roots yeah. of, of of this industry. It is just exactly the opposite, but it's been central to our strategy from the very beginning. Um, you know, uh, obviously, you guys are focusing on the the technology, and there's these other, uh, you know, second generation distributed ledger uh, projects coming up. Um, but uh, my uh, my group will probably kill me if I don't at least try to address this a little bit because so many people invested in the uh, the the initial offering. And I won't ask you about specific numbers or anything, but I'm curious. Um, HBAR investors like me are also looking at the current you know cryptocurrency bull run. And while HBAR has done pretty well, um, it seems like we ought to be doing even better uh, in terms of market cap compared to most of the projects, you know, that, that are higher, uh, in market cap. I mean, you just listen to the story here and the trajectory and everything that the technology, uh, and to me, the only thing I can think is that it's just a, a, a matter of a lack of investor awareness at this point. Do you think that's true? Do you think just people just don't know about it and it, and that other, uh, what is it that drives the yeah. price of a token? Well, no, that, there are a lot of things that will affect the price of a token. Right. We, we, we don't focus on price. Sure. Uh, but we do understand that we've made decisions that, um, set us apart from the rest of the industry and, the reason we've made certain decisions is because we're trying to build a hundred year company. Right. You know, this is not a get rich quick scheme. Yeah. We're in this to create the, the trust layer, the internet for the next generation. That's been the goal from the very beginning. Yep. When I talk about decisions, it, there's some things that we just don't do. The rest of the industry does. For example, we don't do market making. And most, nearly all of the other platforms do market making. What do you mean by that? Can you clarify market making? Yeah. Um, you, you know, so there will be organizations that go in and provide liquidity to the markets okay. that uh, will help close the, the spread between buyers and sellers. Got it. And often that is manipulated to drive the price up or down. Mm-hmm. Not, not always. There sure, are, sure. you know, legitimate market makers out there. But uh, that's the kind of thing that um, token issuers like ourselves maybe shouldn't be involved in. Right. And would be viewed negatively by regulators. Yeah. Potentially. Right. 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 So we don't do that kind of thing. We don't provide staking rewards today. Nearly everybody in the market provides staking rewards. When we talk about staking rewards, what this means is um, if you hold the token, you can go to an organization lock up that token and get an enormous interest rate. It's think of it like a certificate of deposit that pays 20%. Right? Yeah. These, these are the kind of activities that a lot of the market does engage in that does cause short term uh, investor behavior to, to drive up a price, but is unsustainable. And, and then in addition to that, we're not yet listed on some of the top exchanges in the U.S., which is where a lot of the demand is. So, you know, there are just a whole range of um, reasons why the token may or not may not perform the way that the others are. But again, we're not we're not focused on that. Our decision process has always been to take the long view. Yeah. And we 
you know, the value that gets created is not value that gets created by us. It's value that gets created by the community of developers and organizations and enterprises. They're building real applications on top of the platform. And so we, we operate an operating system. Think of it like an operating system. Yeah. And the community is the one that creates the value. One last question for you. Just in terms of this new generation of distributed ledger technology, obviously there are other projects uh, out there that seem interesting. They're fast. They do unique things. Um, you know, some of the ones that come to mind for me that, you know, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how they do or like, you know, Polkadot or uh, the this uh, upcoming uh, launch of the, the inter- internet computer with Definity. How do you see this, um, you know, in the next five years? And obviously not asking you to make any sort of picks. I'm just curious, like if you had this crystal ball and you're looking in five years, how do these things interact with one another based on what they do? Because a lot of people... I think, think about this and say, well, they, they kind of are doing the same thing, right? I mean, maybe the Definity is a little bit different. Obviously, Bitcoin's kind of on its own, but the rest of the projects seem to have a common goal. Can you kind of talk a little bit about how you see that interplay in the future? Yeah, well, most of the projects have some focus area. You know, they, they go in, they want to identify a use case or category. Mm-hmm. And really focus in, on those categories. We, from the beginning, have wanted to make sure that we are the enterprise-grade public network. Yeah. Our council members are all the top, you know, Fortune 500 caliber organizations that in, in, across the globe. And we work with them to ensure that we're providing a platform that they would be willing to spend millions of dollars building their applications on top of. We're unique in the industry and that we have a council that like I described, and that's been an enormous lift. If you think about where we started in 2017, you know, when we, when we pitch this vision, we're going to get the largest companies in the world to work together uh, to create a global public network. We were laughed at. Right, because it's just such an incredibly hard thing to do for a startup, uh, for a startup. And so, uh, but, but I think that it's all important. And while others may focus on, uh, you know, sort of lower level consumer applications, uh, we, we of course care about consumer applications, but mm-hmm. we're wanting to enable the, the enterprises and the businesses of the world to be able to to build on top of us to go to market with those. And so if we if we win the enterprise market, I think we win it all. Yeah. And and that's been the strategy from the beginning. It doesn't seem like there's any of the other projects are really focused on enterprise at all. They're not. Well, I hesitate to say that. I, I yeah. don't know what the other projects are doing behind the scenes, right? Yeah. But what I can say is that the volumes, the transaction volumes, the large transaction volumes our enterprise. You know, there are a lot of use cases that require uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of transactions per second, which means that you have to have a platform that can handle that kind of load. And that's where we're focused. We're focused on those really high end, high performance requiring use cases that are, are deployed by ecosystems of organizations that are global. Well, this is really exciting stuff. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, and um, just uh, congratulations. I mean, and and I, uh, as a somebody who read about this technology back in 2016, and uh, had been looking forward to seeing what would happen, it's just pretty pretty unbelievable. I think just to to see the partnerships, you know, and uh, the fact that even with the transactions, I believe now. It, Dara's got the most transactions of any distributed ledger, right? And well, for- we we crossed the billionth transaction last month, and uh, and to be fair, I think only Ethereum has done more than a billion transactions. So we we're now number two behind Ethereum in total number of transactions, but we did it in eighteen months. Yeah, it took them <laughs> like, about seven years, right? right. So, exactly. Yeah. 
Fantastic stuff. So thanks again, Mance. And, you know, hopefully when, uh, you know, the next phase comes along, uh, we can get you back as, uh, as an update again. Great. Thank you for having me. Thank you. What do the Rothschilds, the Romneys, and the billionaire hedge fund managers know that you don't about growing and protecting wealth? As you might imagine, the wealthy have a few tricks up their sleeves. One strategy allows you to grow wealth tax-free at a compounding rate with no volatility. It protects your money from creditors and lawsuits, and it lets you invest the same money in two different places at the same time. How about that for amplifying wealth? To learn more, go to WealthFormulaBanking.com. Again, that's WealthFormulaBanking.com. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, maybe you got kind of excited like I did. Listen, you know, just broadly speaking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, we've had a lot of these discussions in our premium group, Wealth Formula Network, by the way. um, And you should seriously consider joining if you like talking about this stuff. But one distinction I will make is that I don't think of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in the same vein. In my opinion, there's Bitcoin and then there's everything else. Bitcoin, in my opinion, uh, and I think it's being you know increasingly accepted as this, as digital gold. And I don't think there's any other pure currency play, the digital currency market that will overtake this. I just don't think that that's going to happen. I think Bitcoin is here to stay. And then, so what does that mean for everybody else? Well, they're not trying to be currency, right? I mean, you just heard Hedera. Hedera is not trying to be currency. They are, the rest of these projects are essentially tech companies, right? I'm just simplifying this, but think of them as tech companies. And when you buy their tokens, you are essentially buying a type of stock in these companies. Now, there's some functional stuff that goes along with the use of these tokens, right? I mean, they be used to run the actual network. But fundamentally, when you're buying into them, they go up in value because of the value of the company, right? There's a market capitalization to that company. So, you know, that's the reason why I think it's so important to judge these projects for what they are. They are not currency. They are stock that just happens to be decentralized. Anyway, I encourage you to do some homework on Hedera. Do your own research. If you think it's got legs like I do, then maybe you'll decide to throw your hat in the ring too. But that's all I got this week. This is Buck Joffrey with Wealth Formula Podcast signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not facts. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.